We now move on to the Village of Riverside Board of Trustees regular meeting for Thursday, November 7th, 2019. <coughs> the time is 7.08 p.m. Please call the roll. President Seltz. Here. Trustee Peters. Here. Trustee Gallagos. Here. Trustee Jesus. Here. Trustee Hannon. Here. Trustee Evans. Here. Trustee Pollock. Here. Village Manager Francis. Here. Village Attorney Molina. Here. Also present, Village Clerk Haley. Thank you very much. Those of you at home likely cannot see, we have a room full of uniformed uh, folks with us tonight. Uh, so I'd ask we have with us tonight uh, the Scout Troop number 24, and they're going to lead us in the pledge. If you'd like to step forward now, young men, and we will join you. up on the agenda this evening are presentations and public comment. Our first item tonight is a very happy one. Uh, we're here to swear in a new Riverside Police Patrol Officer, Chief Weitzel. I'd ask the Officer Johnson to step up stand over here. Um, I'd ask the clerk, did you want to swear in first and then have me address the board? Whatever you prefer. That would be great. Johnson II. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And the Constitution of the State of Illinois. And I will faithfully perform the duties. And I will faithfully perform the duties. Of the Office of Patrol Officer. Of the Office of Patrol Officer. For the Village of Riverside, Illinois. For the Village of Riverside, Illinois. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. President, uh, board members, and Manager Francis, I am honored to introduce you to, Dar to Carlo Johnson. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Carl before he comes up. I'll ask him to introduce his family in a moment, and if he wants to address the board, he'll do so. It's been a long road. He's been with us for about a year, but as this board knows, it's a great investment. I'd like you to know that Carlo was the number one candidate on the list when it was posted by the Police and Fire Board. We moved quickly at that time. We had an opening to hire. Make no mistake, the Carlo was on other lists. There were other police agencies competing for him. He has a vast military experience. If he wants to address, he can. It's in his resume I submitted to you. The hiring process really was testing, getting on our list, ending up number one, then uh, deciding that we wanted to make a conditional job offer, uh, going through medical exams, going through an extensive back, uh, background, being accepted, then having to go through the same process to get into the police academy, then being in the police academy for four months, which he, DiCarlo, attended the Cook County Sheriff's Police Academy. While at the academy, he graduated number one in firearms. Um, hopefully he does not have to use that in Riverside, but I say that it's because of his military experience. He was the best firearms candidate that they had in the academy. Um, he came out, went into the field training program. As you see, some of the fellow officers are here, and some of his officers that trained him during that four-month period are here. And then he went into what's called the shadow program, where he's allowed to be in a squad car on his own, but he's not allowed to answer calls on his own. There's always a second police car sent until the field training officers can certify to me that he is able to patrol the streets on his own. Not only 
as a law enforcement officer and for his safety, but for somebody that didn't grow up here, it took to Carlo a little bit to learn our streets. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so um, and I, I want to tell you a couple, a couple things I learned. I met Car the Carlos family at his graduation. Myself, Lieutenant Lauer, and the Deputy Chief were at his graduation. And I can tell you, he comes from just an outstanding family. When I first met his family there, we sat and talked after the graduation, after Car the Carlo was, uh, accepted his award for the firearms, after I met his former cl his classmates, I had some time to spend with his family. And I want to say that you raised a fantastic son. He's an outstanding, be, before I even talk to you about a police officer, he's an outstanding individual. So I really congratulate you on that. Um, I, like I, I'll have you introduce them when you come up. Um, it's, one story I once wanted to tell about the Carlo before he takes the stand is, recently I received a phone call I've never received before from the principal at St. Mary's School. So, the Carlo was assigned to an uh, event at St. Mary's, and the, it was going to be an outside event, but the weather was poor. So they moved the event into the gymnasium. And he decided that he was going to show the St. Mary's class how to dance. <laughs> and they, she sent me uh, not only photos, but the videos of the music that he was leading the dance. And I, I, I'm too old to tell you the band. I would never know them. Uh, it wasn't. but. She called me to tell me how much that connection made to the students there. And um, I thought that was a very high compliment for somebody who's a, a brand new police officer. So um, I'm very proud to have him. I think the officers are very proud to have uh, DiCarlo. He's an outstanding individual. I think when he stands next to me, you kind of look at the old and you look at the new, what the new officers are like. There's a big, there's a big difference here. Um, but I would ask, I would congratulate you and I'd ask you to come up to the podium and please introduce your family and if you'd like to address the board, you're more than welcome. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, Manager Francis, President Sales, trustees of the board, Chief, uh, also giving a, a warm welcome to my family and the police officers, the men and women of the uh, Department of Riverside. Uh, first off, I want to say just thank you for this opportunity. Uh, it's truly an honor and a blessing to stand before you today. Um, before I go into anything, be, the one thing I can say is that when coming up, you never come up alone, all right? Um, and I have an amazing family uh, that I pretty much would want to ask to stand. Um, Starting off first is my father here, has the same name as me, <laughs> Carlo Johnson, so you see where I get the second from. Uh, my brother Sam, a best friend of mine, uh, and Paul, my fiance Raymond, my mother, uh, Tanya here. Uh, when, <laughs> when it comes to uh, the values and, di and disciplines that I've attained, it, it started at home, and, and it started with these individuals that you see before me today. You all have to see. Fun fact about me, uh, as the chief has said, I am a military veteran. I've been in the military for 15 years prior to coming into and taking on this position uh, as an officer. And throughout that time in the military, there were uh, a vast majority of, of things that you learned in there, all right? Not only do you learn your technical and tactical capabilities, as well as leadership, but you also learn what it means to have values, standards, all right? um, not only for yourself, but amongst people that you serve with as well. And the one thing when you, when you talk about men of service is that one word that, that comes in there that comes to mind is in that, that root word to serve that really gets, that gets me. <clears throat> um, one thing I can say with that coming into this, into this department is that you have men and women who are built to serve. And not only, um, not everybody that stands before you today as far as the officers have been a part of the training program that I've been, that I've been a part of, but everybody had a root in making me the officer that I am today. Uh, so I want to say thanks to you all for that. And um, one thing I can say leading up into that is that the disciplines do not stop there. One of the things that I did um, like when I came into this department is, is the fact of 
the, the values and morals that this department uh, definitely has. And it mirrored a lot of the values that are already attained while uh, serving in the military. And not only that, but you also have individuals who like to have fun with the, with the department as well. So with that, one of the things that I can say is that moving forward, uh, I wish to continue on with those values. Um, and now that I've finished my service with the military and have had the opportunity in order to serve my country, now I want to be a service to you all and being able to uh, serve the community, community with the uh, Riverside Police Department. I guess the only thing uh, I would like to say on behalf of the board, you know, Officer Johnson, you're welcome. You're joining a highly respected and distinguished department, as I know that you already know, under the leadership of Chief Weitzel, who is unequaled, in my opinion. Uh, we wish you a long and safe tenure here. And to your family and to your future wife, I want to a pledge to you on behalf of this board that we will make sure that he has all the resources he needs to stay safe. So thank you for sharing him with us. <coughs> thank you, Chief Watson. Thank you. Next up this evening, we have an update on the West Suburban Special Recreation Association. Director Malchiotti, if you'll introduce our guest, please. Well, it's gonna be a tough act to follow. Congratulations again. <laughs> uh, before you, uh, good evening, uh, Village President Sells, Board of Trustees, and Village Manager Francis. In front of you, you have a snapshot uh, provided to you on behalf of WSSRA. I'm going to invite uh, Marianne Burko, Executive Director, to uh, speak to this and answer any questions that you have. But before that, I just wanted to talk about uh, certainly the community and some of the current board members were in on the process. Um, it was very well thought out, uh, with a lot of community <coughs> feedback and input. And uh, I'm proud to say that we're members of WSSRA. I can say that during the entire membership process, it, uh, Mary Ann and her team have been an absolute joy to work with. Uh, really meeting with us, uh, still checking up on us, seeing what we need. I think the obvious thing is uh, to recognize the service to the community that they provide, but the the other side of that is what an amazing resource it is for myself and my department uh, with education of my staff, inclusion aids, and just the sounding board for uh, different situations uh, that we come into contact with. So uh, I thank them for that and at this time I'd like to introduce Executive Director Burko. Well, he did such a great job. <laughs> Good evening. I can't believe a year has already gone by. I'm Marianne Burke. I'm the Executive Director with West Suburban Special Recreation. I see a lot of future workers here. Um, we provide recreation programming for children through adults with disabilities out of 13 communities. And one of those communities is the village of Riverside. So uh, it is a pleasure and an honor to have been able to serve you this last year. And I, uh, what you have in front of you, I apologize, it's flipped upside down on the inside. but. I'll walk you through our snapshot. It's what I do annually for all of our communities. And it's really to give you an overview of what the years look like and uh, what we've accomplished. So uh, for starters, in the snapshot you have stats. Um, and I'm gonna go right to those because it seems to be that's what's most important. Who do we serve and, and what did they do? You're a small community and I'll remind you of that, so your numbers are never gonna be huge, but I think we did a great job in this first year. The very, uh, the snapshot only shows you the fall session because you started with West Suburban as of September 1st, 2018. Um, we served six participants during that session. Um, they participated in uh, 41 program opportunities, um, 21 events, 
and it's hard to read for me, uh, 646 um, total service hours. Um, and what I gave you was a snapshot, um, that additional piece of paper <coughs> gives you the preliminary stats for 2019. And you have uh, 15 unique individuals who participated in 69 programs, 26 events. Um, that may not seem like a big number, but it really is. It's quite um, uh, possible um, for a first year community that's one of the largest. So uh, I commend uh, everyone's efforts to get the word out. There's more to do. Um, in addition to those folks, we also have uh, inclusion participation. So we have a full spectrum of services. We have programming that are for children through adults uh, that are separated, that are with West Suburban. And then uh, they also have anyone with a disability has the opportunity to participate in regular programs that uh, the Recreation Department offers. And we will provide additional support uh, when needed in those programs. And this year in 2019, in fall of 2018, there were no, no participants in the inclusive programs. And then in 2019, we had uh, three participants in five different programs at an additional cost of approximately $3,000. Now that's uh, preliminary. We don't have the year over yet, so um, I thought that you might want to get uh, have that specific information. So how did we do this? We worked at getting the word out. We met with the special education director for District 96 and Riverside Brookfield High School and established a plan for service and communication. Uh, WSSRA attended a parent liaison meeting at Hauser Junior High uh, to inform parents of our services. And we also um, presented at a special education um, event where families were present. And that those both happened in October and November of 2018. Uh, WSSRA offered two information nights at the Village of Riverside, um, also last fall. And we continue to work at orienting folks to the agency. Um, early on, we did um, an orientation with the recreation staff. Um, and we also did a specific training program of our inclusion program. Uh, I also presented to the River, Riverside Recreation Board and uh, conference with President uh, Sells early in the year of two, 2019. I presented to the local Lions Club who supported WSRA with a donation check. And uh, we increased our visibility by being at uh, local events. We were a part of both 18 and 19, the Touch a Truck event, the Howl, Halloween event. Um, it's a great name. Uh, the holiday stroll we did last year and we'll also be a part of that this year. Uh, we have a presentation set up in early, uh, 2020 to promote our day camp and winter spring programs. Uh, we put up signage for all of our events at the Recreation Department. Uh, we post information on the Village website and we have uh, ads in the Recreation Department's program guide. We post flyers through the District uh, 96 who post them on their website and home um, and their homepage through the special ed and it goes home through the special ed teachers. Um, to the specific students. So there's a lot of effort in terms of outreach and getting the word out, but that never ends. It's an ongoing process. So educating all of you tonight is an important piece of continuing to get that word out. Um, one of the things we also um, were able to create uh, is a relationship with Riverside Township. And uh, through countless communications with the Township Board through Representative John Shostuski, uh, we established an agreement, um, and that agreement uh, pays 50% of the program fee, reimburses 50% of the program fees to the participants of Riverside Township. Uh, this does not include overnight trips, day camp, and any programs that incorporate gambling or alcohol. Thus, the township has reimbursed families for over $2,100 during the course of the four seasons. Um, and that's a pretty unique, unique relationship. We do have other township funding that goes on um, that is um, scholarship related. So some program highlights. 
WSSRA established two local programs during the course of the year. Two classrooms at uh, Blythe Park Elementary School participate in our Lucatuck, our toy lending library program. WSSRA offered <coughs> two four-week sessions of swim lessons at the Riverside Swim Club where eight local residents participated. Um, obviously, aside of all of those programs, the other 70 programs that we offer seasonally, our participants, um, all of our participants are eligible to be a part of. Uh, we hosted 180 campers in our summer day camp program at 11 different locations, and four of those participants were from Riverside. We had um, offered 10 Special Olympic sports during the course of the year, basketball, bowling, swimming, track and field, softball, gymnastics, junior golfers, advanced golfers, and um, young athletes program. Four Riverside residents participated uh, among the 100 athletes who competed in 391 programs, trainings, and competition, who came uh, home with 92 medals total for the year. WSSRA hired three staff from Riverside in 2019. So keep that in mind, guys. If you're looking for uh, an opportunity to work, we start hiring at the age 16. We'll take volunteers at 15. Um, and they're a critical part of our success as an agency. <coughs> We also have a very active foundation, of which we have a new member from Riverside, Kim Perry. Um, the group, uh, hardworking group of men and women raised over 70000 in 2018, and it will be pretty close to that in 2019. But it's also been a really challenging year with so much going on. We spent the last 12 months preparing for a retirement of a 39-year uh, employee with the association and that a very first time a full-time staff has ever retired from the agency. So with that, we had three internal moves as a result, um, and so there's a fair amount of transition going on within our staffing. But all is going well, and um, I'm excited to say that, uh, you know, we continue to work really hard at making sure our communications in this community are ongoing. Our board uh, has been busy welcoming the village of Riverside to the Association, a special thanks to Ron uh, as your board representative and Karen Johns as the alternate. alternate. Uh, w, uh, Ron has been very committed to attending all of our meetings. He comes prepared and ready to complete all that needs to be accomplished. But the most important part of my presentation here tonight is putting a face to the work we do every day. As you see in the snapshot that I gave you, you have a photo of Luke Perry, and Luke is enjoying uh, a kayaking program on the Des Plaines River. He's enjoyed many programs this year, from swim lessons, outdoor adventures, school days out, and Saturday bowling. Each one of these experiences has opened his world to building his confidence, to making new friends, <coughs> having new experiences, and doing things just like his siblings. Mom says he loves everything about WSSRA, even riding the bus. The Perrys thank the village of Riverside for giving Luke these opportunities. And I thank you for your continued support and happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Director Burke? Marion, thank you. We're delighted that you're a part of our community and we look forward to a long and fun partnership with you. Thank you. We do thank as you well. Much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, I'm going to ask Chief Weitzel to step back up. He's going to give us a crime prevention <coughs> strategy update. Good evening again, President Sells, Trustee, <coughs> Manager Francis. I was asked by the village manager to brief the board um, on what we've accomplished since our February 1st memo to the board after some high profile criminal incidents had taken place earlier in the year, most notably in, February, in uh, January. So I included in the packet the original memo I did for the board back in February, and I've included a memo of what has actually taken place thus far. And I'm going to hit the highlights, and then if any of the trustees have a question I could answer or a suggestion for us or any of the residents do, I'd be happy to answer those. So let me first say that the, um, one of the very first things we did after that shooting incident on Forest Avenue is to re reach out to Director App. And Director App, um, gave me a complete list of all rental properties in Riverside. Um, and we sent out letters to those that asked them if they would voluntarily meet with us. 
to go over site surveys for their property. We had um, response from all the big apartment complexes, and to my surprise, we had some you know, smaller um, rental properties on Groveland, Lincoln, and, and Harlem Avenue, even Harlem Avenue. And we would send an officer uh, to meet with them, either one of two officers, who would talk about what they could do to improve their property from our perspective. Most of that centered around landscaping, and I mean like cutting the landscaping down so you could actually see. Increased lighting was a big issue for uh, tenants and landlords because when we showed up at some of these meetings, the landlords would bring, they would put a notice out and if any of their tenants wanted to attend, they allowed them to come. It was an on-site survey done at the complex and we would walk around. For example, the Dol I'll take the Dolges property, for example, we walked, we walked that property and we suggested signage, lighting, and a video surveillance system, which they have done all of those. And in addition to that, um, we went into some issues on public uh, space there. So like the hallways, the vestibules, some of the vestibules, the locking system wasn't working, the buzzing system wasn't working, and they just hadn't updated that. Um, so we would do a report, we would follow back up with, the, with the, either the building management, the owner, or whoever they designated. That was very successful. That took about almost five months to complete, because it was voluntary, we didn't make anyone do it, but we did have a good, a good um, turnout. And there were several of the larger apartment buildings on Harlem Avenue between <coughs> Long Common and Addison that participated in that. So I think that was very useful. Um, and as a product of that, Two of the largest apartment complexes in Riverside put in uh, closed circuit televisions on their public ways. So that means either in their vestibule areas and or their courtyard areas. And they have given us access to those. So they have given us their IP addresses um, for my detectives to access so we don't have to call the property management company and ask them for their video. And in addition to that, several businesses have recently put in enhanced video surveillance and um, have signed an agreement that they will work with us to give us a video if we need that. So they, the, the, either, the, either the property owners or in some cases the businesses have been very receptive. In one case, one of the larger businesses in Riverside came to us after they heard what was going on and said, hey, you can access our cameras, our outside cameras now, these are outside cameras, at any time, just come in and ask for this person. And what they did a lot of times is they trained their staff, because what would happen with these, especially the apartment complexes, is they would get these fancy, sophisticated systems, but the person that knows how to operate it works nine to five, Monday through Friday, and lives near the Indiana border. So for us to get that person back here to give us access to it would take hours upon hours to get the video. And so they, a lot of them train their staff who live close by that they could just come in and, and help detectives if they, if they had a serious crime, which I thought was, um, was really, that was their approach to us. So that was, I think, an outstanding thing. So those are really called safety surveys, so we did those. Um, we tried to get more information out to our residents, either through eFlash, our Twitter account, or just sp speaking e events. Um, another big item was <laughs> we, Put, or I put a directive out to my sergeants that, for, this is just an example, we were taking a bike theft, and the bike theft took place on Mishaw Road. And the officer, all he needs to do is write a report. It's not an arrest situation. He doesn't need to come into the station. He doesn't need to go to Central Booking in North Riverside. So we asked them if they could park in, on Forest Avenue, Pine, West, East, Kimbark, pull over to the curb, and they have computers in their cars, and they can type out reports that are not complicated, that are short report reports, and the police car can sit there in that area for 15, 20 minutes and do that work. That has since happened. Um, we used to do that with the schools by doing it in the parking lots. I think that was very successful, um, and, and it's still going on now. Obviously, if it's a complicated report or they have to bring somebody in custody, that doesn't apply. but. With the way these squad cars are set up nowadays, they can do those reports right in the squad car. So when the res some residents do call me and say the police car has been sitting in front of my house for 20 minutes, what is he doing? He's actually doing something. Um, in most cases, he's writing a report, he or she. Um, we expanded the yellow tag program on nighttime. It's basically a midnight function, but they're door hangers. 
And we've told the officers that this is a crime prevention tool. If you see an open garage door or somebody, the family left their bikes out or they left their big wheels out, um, maybe you can put it away for them if it doesn't look like if it was just a mistake. And you could shut the garage door and put a door hanger on that says we were here and did this. Then you're not waking the family up at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning just to come out and put the stuff away because that's really the preventing the crime. So we, we, a crime hasn't happened. The officers just might be on patrol at 3 o'clock in the morning and see you left your $800 racing bike out and your garage door is open. Well, they'll, they'll go in. They'll put the bike in your garage. They'll shut the garage door. Most of the, our residents have to that's the pad there if they can do that. And they'll leave the door hanger there instead of waking you up. So that's been a very successful, <coughs> we expanded that. Um, you should know that when we expanded it, um, one of the residents that got the card came into the police department and gave us a $500 check to go purchase more of them. So it didn't even come out of our budget. Um, so, um, I th you know, that, but those are the type of residents we have. I mean, they literally walked into the police department. We're, we're happy that we put their kids' big wheels and bikes away and they wanted to fund it. So, um, and one of the uh, really big pieces are closed circuit televisions that are in the public that's owned by the Village of Riverside. So as you know, the board approved uh, um, over phasing up to $130,000. We started the program, it's just been up and running fully functional probably in the last 90 days to maybe 120 days. It's a high definition cameras. Uh, I put in the memo where they are at currently. The picture I have in there is not to, it's not to pick every camera because some of the cameras are these bubble cameras that have multiple heads. So if you see this bullet list of all these cameras, you're like, well, that's a lot of cameras in town, but it may actually be just one housing unit with four units in it that catch the whole area. So the ones that are in the train station actually catch the entire center of town, Pine Avenue, and then there's some that are on Blooming Bank Road in front of the train station. We have two at First and Forest and Ridgewood that catch traffic that goes westbound out of town. There is one specifically designated for westbound traffic leaving Riverside that depicts the picture. And then there's a wider shot that gets the whole intersection and that is a pan tilt zoom camera that the, they can control to zoom in and pan wider. They are all our color high definition. I included a picture of just normal traffic, but that is a picture that the officers can zoom in and get a license plate. And for some reason, if they don't get a front license plate, but the car does have a back license plate, the wider camera will catch that. So the reason we put those there is if we're looking for criminals, they're most likely fleeing out of town. So we position the camera so that they would be going, they'd be driving westbound from the center of town. Um, we all, as you know, we have an agreement with District 96 that this board approved. That, that ITAN has not been put in yet, but we're hoping if that phase goes through, that would be in phase two. But the actual agreement has been signed by both this board and District 96 board. Um, so we have been successful. On the cameras so far, we've had five either situations where we could solve the crimes. Three of those we made an arrest on. One was a bike theft. One was a, uh, a woman that was riding her bike and somebody um, inappropriately touched her. And um, we got uh, a video of that and we got a f film of it. We held a photo line up and we uh, identified that person. However, she didn't want to press charges, but we still were able to identify and clear that case. And we've had a few other arrests out of those situations. So we've had five what I would call hits and two of our residents have just declined to prosecute, but we have uh, solved the crime and the other three um, prosecuted. Two of those were in the camera that's right here in front of the police station that covers Burling in front of the library and over in front of the bank. Um, and then we, we had the one that caught the individual stealing the bike at the center of town. You know, and that was quite a story. That individual lived in Aurora had traveled to Chicago just to steal stuff every single day and got kicked off the train. So the only reason he ended up here is because he was causing a disturbance on the train. So the conductor kicked him off in Riverside. So he didn't really have anywhere to go, so he just, we had him on video for an hour just walking around, walking around, until he steals the bike and then he doesn't think our resident's bike is that good. He rides from here to Western Springs, he dumps our resident bike, steals another bike from Western Springs and then goes back to Aurora. So we ended up solving Western Springs crime too. So, um, and that, if you saw that picture, it was clear as, I mean, the detectives put a, a, a wanted 
poster to our neighboring police agencies, and within one hour, the Clarendon Hills Police Department had a detective call our detectives. It said they had arrested him before, and they knew him and gave him the information, and I think we had him in custody a day or two later. So very, very good system. It can be viewed in the police station, in our public safety analyst room, in the detective's office, in the squad cars. The squad cars was the last piece, um, so the officers can call that up on their laptop computers in there. However, they can't take it with them, so if they, if they disconnect that computer from their docking station, it doesn't allow them, for security reasons and ethical reasons, it doesn't, it doesn't go beyond the squad car. We do keep the videos right now all in public for 90 days. That is the suggestion of the state's attorney's office and the public defender's office. So if we have an arrest, they could view the video, see if they want to preserve it and keep it. Outside of that, it's, it's, it's written over every 90 days. Now we can, we can adjust that ourselves. If we wanted to only keep it 30 days, we could. If we wanted to keep it 60 days. When I shopped around to other police departments that have this system, most specifically River Forest is the one I personally visited, their policy was 90 days. So um, when I visited, um, so it was Hinsdale, their policy was 90 days. And that, that's really driven on having the video there so that the, not only defense counsel could have it if they need it, but so could prosecutors. It does not store license plates. I want to make that clear. It's not a license plate reader. It does not run, the camera does not run license plates through the lead system in Illinois to find out who's driving you. What I mean when it captures your license plate, it just holds it. And if we need it in 90 days to go back and see if a crime was committed, it'll store it. But it does not, is not a license plate reader that runs it through the system. Um, it's not designed that way currently. My only other uh, update is I am, I have personally talked to Ring. So we made an application to get involved in their neighborhood app program. And unfortunately, I made that application just when they were bought out by Amazon. They're having a lot of technical issues there. We have been contacted with them, and we are on the list. But there are thousands of police agencies throughout the country waiting to get on this system. Because you have to be approved by the ring, and you have to uh, adopt their policies. But for our residents, it'll be totally voluntary. You do not have to join. You do not have to share your video with us if you don't want to. Um, and it is going to expand beyond Ring. So if you, um, it, it, residents that own, have a Nest product, the Nest is going to be starting the same system. Because we do have residents that call me and say, I don't have a Ring video, but my, I have a Nest system that captures video. So that, that, is, that is also going to be available within the next maybe six months, Nest said. So really going forward from there, um, where would we do phase two? I think we would, if, if the board approves additional funding <coughs> or continuing funding, I think we would concentrate on Harlem Avenue, meaning cameras that go logically for me, it'd be the eastbound cameras, maybe at Burlington and one on Burlington and Harlem and Quincy, and then catching the Harlem Avenue because most, most of the people that come into town to commit, they, they don't like our streets, so they flee on these straight streets that are Quincy and Burlington and Forest Avenue and maybe even Woodside, the 31st. Um, so that would be a logical location for us to put up additional cameras in the future. Um, it's been very, um, very successful. So I can take any questions that the board may have or any suggestions that you may have or even from our residents. That's fine. Questions? Uh, this is very impressive work, Chief Weitzel, as usual, and I, I really commend you and your department on how proactive you're being, and, and, you, and especially the um, amazing cooperation you're getting from our residents and our businesses. This is the way law enforcement today should be working, and so I really commend you and your department on what you're doing here. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, thank you. And uh, this is a very interesting memorandum that the chief just was talking about, and if our residents would like to take a look at it, you can see it on this agenda, the regular meeting agenda starting at page seven. So next up is public comment. It looks like the remaining guests we have here are other than Mr. Uphughes are, is Troop 24. Any public comment from Troop 24? Yeah, actually there is. If you could come up to the podium, please. No, no, this gentleman here. No, I'm just <laughs> My comment actually is not directly related to 
through 24 per did se. You, did but, you introduce yourself, please? Uh, yes, I am uh, Tim Lager, Scoutmaster of Riverside Troop 24. Several able assistant Scoutmasters are here in support of our young Scouts who are here to learn their civic duty and fulfill some of their citizenship merit badge requirements in the quest for Eagle, which many of you are familiar with is the highest rank. But I did not come here actually to comment on behalf of the troop. It's interesting that um, Ms. Burko's remarks relative to the uh, WSSRA uh, inspired me. I wanted to say one thing, and she was talking about the Perry family, uh, Kim and Luke and Tony. And I wanted to mention something in support of the WSSRA and the spirit of that organization and also to talk to our young scouts here who are also members of the community about character and support. I was asked by Tony Perry to co-coach a Little League team for his son Luke many years ago. It was a t-ball team and it was a fascinating process because sports in general, baseball, soccer, you name it, is on the one hand competitive, but it also involves team building and camaraderie and support. And so it's a balance between encouraging the competitive edge, but also encouraging having support for one's teammates. And it's not easy because you have young kids who want to do really well, and you don't, but you also want them to support one another. Well, we had a season, and Luke Perry was on this team. And uh, I don't know that all the players, when the season first started, you know, it's t-ball. Some of you can swing and hit the ball up to the outfield. Some of you swing and hit the tee, and it plops on the ground. There's lots of levels of ability. Um, but Luke was a special character, and he needed some assistance, and he was on the team, and it was a spirit of inclusion which is also not lost in our public school system, the spirit of inclusion in the classroom. And across that season, we helped nurture Luke Perry on that team. And one of my fondest memories of I have to pause because it's so remarkable, but one of my fondest memories of that season as a coach is in the last game Luke Perry came up to bat at his tee, and our team had finally figured out that we were there to support him, to hit that ball and to run around the bases. And so Luke Perry, he came up and he hit that ball, and no, it didn't go far. It did not make it all the way to third base, but he ran, and he ran as hard as he could, and everyone knew what he was doing, and the outfield played it, so that he could get that single, and then everyone cheered. Because Luke Perry achieved that single, hitting that ball off that tee. And for him, that was a real achievement. And for the team, it was an achievement in supporting him. So I say that, I provide that anecdote to the board and to anyone who supports the SSRA and Ms. Burko to say that absolutely the inclusion of everyone who wants to participate is critical. And we as scouts have to foster that spirit within our troop and within the community in general. So Mr. Sells, thank you for having us here. That's my public comment. We're going to adjourn, but it was a terrific meeting. Thank you, Tim. Thank you, young men. <coughs> Thank you very much. It's probably one of those badges or something. Wow. God, I love this town. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Appreciate you coming tonight. <coughs> talk about having a hard act to follow. Um, next up is the reports of village officers. Uh, for my report, I would just like to mention uh, 
a meeting that we had this past week uh, concerning the upcoming census in 2020. Uh, we were lucky enough to have Senator Durbin, Congressman uh, Chuy Garcia, Representatives Villanueva and uh, Hernandez here. And it was a very, very interesting and enlightening discussion, very early stages about planning for the upcoming census. Uh, Riverside will be <coughs> forming a complete count committee uh, in the coming weeks and months to help further the effort to get a complete count in, in Riverside. The, the major populations that we learned at, at this uh, very helpful session that typically go undercounted are small children under the age of five, people living in, ex in extended uh, households, minorities, uh, and uh, homeless. So we'll be making special efforts to ensure that those, those people are counted because it's very important. This is not a count of citizenship. This is a count of persons within our community. And we're gonna make every, make every effort to make sure that everyone is, is included. Just the practical uh, ramifications of the count, I'll just give you two. One is our continuing represent, representation in the U.S. Congress. Uh, we, it is possible that, that Illinois could lose uh, up to two representatives if we do not have a proper count in the 2020 census. And in terms of dollars and cents, every person that is undercounted in Illinois cost the state of Illinois $14,000 over a course of 10 years, and that's in federal funding. So not only is it the right thing to do, uh, it's also a, pra a practical thing to do and it inures to the benefit of our community and our state. So uh, watch this space. You're gonna be hearing a lot more about the census as we move on into next year. It begins in March and will run through August. Uh, so you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the weeks and months to come. And we appreciate uh, all of those representatives coming to visit here in Riverside. That's all I had, Manager Francis. I have one item this evening. First, I want to thank Riverside residents for their patience um, on Halloween, the storm, the branches, all of that. Um, Public Works has been working very diligently, so I also want to thank Public Works for their outstanding work. Um, it's important to note that to date they picked up 24 truckloads of chip branches. Um, that's the equivalent of 192 cubic yards. Um, so, needless to say, there's plenty of mulch available at Public Works. So, hours of operation are 8.30 to, the, it'll be available 8.30 to 3 p.m. So, feel free to come by and pick up some mulch. That is all I have. Making lemonade out of lemons, are we? Trying. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much. We'll move on now to the approval of the consent agenda. On the agenda this evening it is to approve the voucher list of bills for November 7, 2019. Approve the Village Board of Trustee regular meeting and public hearing minutes of October 17. Review and file the following Riverside Historical Commission meeting minutes of September 16. The Finance Department September 29 monthly report. A motion to approve the special event application for the Riverside Chamber of Commerce's 45th annual holiday stroll. Listen to this part to be held on Friday, December 6, 2019. Holiday stroll, December 6. A resolution to approve a change order for BS and A for ERP and community development software for savings in the amount of $2,195. A resolution authorizing the village manager to execute a construction agreement with Martam Construction in the amount of $98,691 for the Railroad Watershed Area Storm Sewer Outlet Project. A resolution of the Village of Riverside authorizing the village manager to enter into a contract with Williams Architects for professional design services in an amount not to exceed $25,500, and a resolution authorizing the village manager to enter into a contract with FH Passion for the renovations of the building at 43 East Quincy for an amount not to exceed $405,500. Does anyone need any item removed for discussion? Hearing none, I'd ask for a motion and second to approve. So moved. So moved. By, a motion by Mr. Gallegos. Second. Second. <clears throat> by Mr. Pollock, please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Gallegos. Aye. Trustee Jesus. Aye. Trustee Hammond. Aye. Trustee Hammond. Aye. Trustee Pollock. Aye. Motion carries. 
Next up are reports of departments, commissions, and trustee liaisons. Are there any liaison reports this evening? I have one. Please, Ms. Evans. Um, I have a TV commission report. Over the past couple of years, the TV commission has had a vision of broadening the scope of its programming beyond, beyond its primary mission of broadcasting government, school, nonprofit, and other non-political meetings and events. The commission is currently formalizing, formalizing criteria to be used in determining additional newsworthy community events that Riverside TV will produce in air. The goal is to increase viewership and community awareness of the commission's primary business of producing insightful village and township meeting and event programs. Um, and just as a reminder, River, Riverside residents can watch Riverside TV on Comcast and Xfinity Channel 6 and AT&T U-verse Channel 99. And you can also find programming on the Riverside TV Facebook page. Thank you very much. Any other trustee? We'll move on then to department uh, reports. We first up is an estimate of the 2019 property taxes to be levied for the village of Riverside and the Riverside Public Library. Director Johns. Good evening. Tonight the village announces its estimate of the 2019 property tax levy as well as the 2019 tax levy estimate for the Riverside Public Library. The State of Illinois Truth in Taxation Law requires that the village calculate the dollar amount of the ag aggregate property tax levy for 2019. Such calculation needs to be presented no, more, no less than 20 days prior to the village board adopting the levy. The 2019 levy ordinance is scheduled for adoption at the December 5th, 2019 board meeting. As a non-home rural community, the village's tax levy can only increase by the lesser of 5% increase over the prior year's levy or the percentage increase in the consumer price index plus any new growth or property. Since the percentage increase in the consumer price index was 1.9%, and is the lesser of 5%, the final actual 2019 tax levy is expected to increase by approximately 1.9% plus any new growth. Keeping all of that in mind, the following tax levy estimate for the 2019 tax levy for the village's cap fund is $5,070,434 $84,050 for the non-capped funds for a total levy of $6,154,484. Of this total levy amount, $417,050 will be abated, which will result in a net 2019 levy for the village totaling $5,737,434. This represents an approximate 3.86% of the prior year's levy of $5,524,197. The Cook County Tax Extension Office will subsequently adjust the, this 2019 levy amount once the actual new growth is known. It is standard practice for non-home rule municipalities to levy for more than the 5% or percentage increase in CPI to ensure receipt of all potential property tax revenues with the full knowledge that Cook County will be reducing the levy to the maximum allowed by law. At this time, no updates are planned to the village portion of this levy. For the Riverside Public Library, the estimated 2019 tax levy is calculated at $1,138,592, which is an increase of approximately 1.88% over the prior year's final levy of $1,117,594. The Cook County Tax Extension Office will also adjust this levy once the actual new property is known. The Village, sorry, the Riverside Public Library Board may adjust this request at their November meeting to increase to the, to a, at a minimum to the 1.9%. Are there any questions regarding the tax levy estimate? Questions? Mr. Pollock? I have a question. We're, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, we're, our levy is projecting 4% in new growth. Is that correct? It projected a 3% in new 3%. growth. 3%. Mm -hmm. How does, how do, how do we usually end up when we act, what, 
do we usually see one percent, two percent, zero? We typically see closer to to one percent. Um, in talking with the um, with Fran, the assessor, she's expecting a little lower than that. However, it's prudent to right. ask for more and let the county cut us off. Understood. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Thank you, Director. You're welcome. This is always a very busy time of the year for our finance department. So we appreciate all the work that you do. Next up are ordinances and resolutions. We only have one before us. It's an ordinance amending section 4109, permitting requirements applicable to all floodplain areas of chapter 10, floodplain regulations, and title four, building regulations, of the village code of the village of Riverside relative to accessory structures in the floodplain. Director Apt, welcome. The village has adopted floodplain regulations to regulate construction within our floodplain pursuant to the police powers that have been granted to us by the Illinois Municipal Code. The purpose of these regulations is to maintain our eligibility in the National Flood Insurance Program and to minimize potential losses due to periodic flooding. Uh, the village was recently made aware that a part of our existing floodplain regulations, specifically on minor accessory buildings located in the floodplain, are a bit outdated. Um, our floodplain regulations state that accessory buildings um, such as detached garages that are going to be located in the floodplain with a low floor level below the base flood elevation must be valued at less than $10,000 and must be less than 500 square feet in floor size. Um, we were reviewing a permit um, that did not meet this and it was requested whether a variance would be available um, to be able to build this garage. Um, Unfortunately, uh, I did not have the answer, so I inquired with our village engineer who looked into it and said that um, there's no specific regulations in the MWRD ordinance, and so they rely on the local municipalities to have that. So what we have in our ordinance is what you have to follow. So he followed up with um, both FEMA and IDNR to find out if this is something that we would even be able to allow to have a variance for. Um, they said they don't have strict guidelines. Um, however, they did state that the existing language is somewhat outdated, um, that, you know, maybe at least 10, 15 years old, um, but they advised against doing a variance and suggested that a code amendment would be more prudent. Um, the village engineer has looked at the model ordinance that IDNR does have um, for development in the floodplain, which does provide for limits of $15,000 <coughs> in value for detached accessory structures and a size equivalent to a 24 by 24 garage, so a slightly larger two-car garage um, for accessory buildings that are located in the floodplain with a base floor level that's below the base flood elevation. So you have an ordinance before you that adopts those changes. Um, the village engineer has stated that it would be appropriate for us to amend that section to update it to meet those um, those more updated uh, larger values and size. Any questions for Director Hammond? I'd ask for a motion a second to approve an ordinance amending section 1409, <coughs> excuse me, of chapter 10, title 4 of the village code relative to accessory structures in the floodplain. So moved. By Mr. Gallagher. <coughs> second. Second by Mr. Pollock. Please call the roll. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Jesus. Trustee Hanson. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Director. We move on now to considerations. Uh, just a little background on this. We're going to be talking about zoning tools available to encourage development or redevelopment in the village's biz commercial districts. Those of you who have been kind of following the work of this board knows that, know that we've done uh, considerable work in the past with re relation to the, the municipal code itself, trying to make Riverside a more business-friendly and welcoming environment. So this is a continuation of that. I had asked our, our <coughs> staff to take a further look at, um, at the code to see if there were any zoning tools available to us that might help us spur uh, additional uh, business or economic development. And this is an outgrowth of that request. Director Hatt. Thank you. Uh, we began to look at some comparable communities that have experienced redevelopment investment in their downtowns or other commercial areas um, to review what zoning tools they are utilizing and how their zoning regulations compare to ours. Uh, these communities included Brookfield, River Forest, LaGrange and LaGrange Park, Western Springs, Clarendon Hills, and Hinsdale. Some of the zoning regulations that these other communities are utilizing include planned unit developments, or PUDs, um, and some denser bulk regulations, uh, specifically uh, maximum building heights that allow for up to, in some cases, six stories. 
um, I have a, included a table that kind of outlines the different um, communities and what their requirements are. As you can see, all of the communities surveyed do allow for planned unit developments. Um, three of the communities have similar uh, bulk height regulations to us. They allow a maximum of three stories, which is what our code allows. Um, three of them allow four stories or more, and there's one community that has even stricter height requirements than we do at two and a half stories. Um, so you can kind of see where we fall amid, uh, amid some of these other uh, communities. Uh, PUDs are not something that we allow in the village. We don't have any code requirements or any processes related to planned unit developments. Um, they are a zoning tool that's intended to encourage and allow more creative and flexible development of land um, that's going to result in a better development and a design than might, otherwise, than might otherwise be accomplished if they had to adhere to the strict rules of a zoning ordinance. So rather than going through a variance process, they would go through a PUD process, which would allow a little bit more flexibility than the standards for a variance allow. Um, typically, you're looking at this for a development that's going to provide some sort of uh, compensating amenities that's helping the village achieve a goal or us to get better, higher quality development um, for a better use of land. You'll see these typically used for larger redevelopments. So if you're looking like a golf course that's being redeveloped into different kind of development or if somebody's creating a new um, sort of downtown, town center kind of development or even in some greenfield developments where they're going to be looking at doing something that's uh, a myriad of uses. So maybe one area is going to be mixed use and another area is going to have townhomes and another area is going to have, you know, apartment high rises, and they're looking at this as a as a whole development um, and this one, you know, larger plot of land. Um, but it can also be utilized in a smaller community where there's a lot of infill development, such as Riverside, and you can see that other communities in the area are using it as well. Um, Infill development has its own constraints that comes with it, and a PUD would allow that flexibility to be able to look at that development <clears throat> as a whole and see where we can get the best development possible there um, and allow for some flexibility with some of our zoning requirements, whether it be parking or mix of uses or height or setbacks and things like that. It allows for some of those modifications to happen. Um, if we did adopt a PUD ordinance, it would have standards in there. So you would be able to say as you're looking at an individual plan, okay, what public benefit, um, what objectives is this helping the village meet um, in deciding whether or not you're gonna allow some of those modifications to what our code does require. So um, we are working with RTA. Um, they are going out through the procurement process and we're hoping to be working with them in 2020 to update our zoning code. And one of the things that we're looking at there is how can we improve our zoning code um, to get the best development possible and encourage redevelopment in our commercial areas. It's the primary purpose of this zoning code update. But in the meantime, I'm looking to get some direction from you. Is this something you would like the Planning and Zoning Commission to look into a little bit more so we can kind of provide that input to RTA and the consultant that we choose um, as we start to kickstart that zoning update process. <coughs> so two quick questions before yes. I turn it over to the trustees. Um, you use a, a term that I'm not familiar infill development. Um, what, is, so what does that mean? Infill development is where you're looking at an already mostly built out community. Um, if you have some varying vacant lots or if you have a redevelopment of existing lots that are within it. So it's not you're not going outside of your corporate boundaries. You're looking at development on already developed land within your community. So, so in the context of, and I, this is very preliminary, but can you, can you give us an example of how a PUD might be used within our community? Since we're primarily a built-out community, right. how, how, how would it help us? Um, the one that stands out to me is, is as we look at Bank of America has been vacated. Um, you have a piece of property over there that has an existing building on it, has the existing parking lot across the street. Um, what sort of redevelopment opportunities are available there? It's a unique site and then it's bisected by a road, so they have property on both sides of the street. Um, this is a, a tool that we could use to help look at that development of both parcels kind of as a, in a holistic area. And if there's some give and take that need to happen from one side of the street, part of the development to the other side of the street, but being able to look at it in a kind of a holistic manner um, at both sides being developed. Uh, this is an op PUD kind of affords that opportunity to have that flexibility and look at that unique situation um, of those two lots and whatever development plan that could happen there. Um, similarly, uh, the Village Center development could have been one that could have been a PUD back in the day when that building was built. It was a conglomeration of lots, other buildings that were put together and creating that, um, <clears throat> that development. So. So the question before you uh, is, is whether this is something uh, we would like staff to move forward with to discuss more fully with the Planning and Zoning 
uh, commission and of course ultimately come to you for your consideration. So any thoughts or questions? Just, uh, sort of echo your question. I, you know, I understand the uniqueness of the Bank of America a lot because it straddles two sides of the street. I'm just trying, you know, my experience with uh, PUD zoning has been with larger developments where you have a shopping center complex that's going to have some mixed use. Um, you know, I sort of look at the village and other than Bank of America, I'm struggling with what other parcels, um, you know, if there was going to be something, a downtown redevelopment, it would be, you know, multiple parcels, probably one or connected buildings. I don't know if that rises to a level of, of something that needs to be addressed through a PUD or if that could be handled through regular zoning. I, I just, I'm reluctant to go down a path that it's really just for Bank of America par parcel. Mr. What I wanted to add is when you have a planned unit development ordinance or planned development ordinance, something like PUDs or PD, you define the trigger. And in a smaller community that can, you can be actually applicable anywhere in a given district, like say the business district. And what it does is it, it, it telegraphs to developers that they don't have to meet the strict criteria of the bulk requirements or attempt to get a variation which requires hardship. It telegraphs to developers that the village is open to <coughs> something that doesn't meet the bulk requirements that don't show hardship, but you've got to sell it to us. And usually plan development procedures don't require but suggest and provide for pre-presentation meetings so that the village can have input on what it would like to see before staff recommends flexibility or deviations from the strict bulk requirements. So the main benefit you get is you may have developers who don't want to come to the village to even check because there's no real process in order to do that. that that's right there in the code. That's the, that's the one big difference. Did you want to address Mr. Hannon's question? No, I would say similar to that. I think um, for, for developers, hearing the word variation is typically going to be a big hurdle. And if that's their only means um, for getting um, relief from the strict um, regulations of the zoning ordinance, uh, there tends to be uh, a little bit of pushback or less interested in unless it's a piece that they really, 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 really want. Because you have to show hardship. Because so, there's that hardship threshold that can be difficult. I want a pretty building, so it makes it better for me to do it this way is not necessarily a hardship that you can look at in the code. You know, we get a better development that we're going to be able to sell better, but we can't uh, meet this specific requirement. But those de those decisions would ultimately belong to this board. Yes. Yes. Mr. Pollock, did I see your hand? Uh, yes. So, you know, I, I hear uh, statements such as, you know, it replaces the need for variation or, you know, from couple of sources, and, and that's correct, but I, let's be clear, it's, PUDs are often abused as just replacements for variations, and that's really not what they are at their core. I, I support PUDs, and, and I think it'd be fitting for, for Riverside, but it's a trade-off, and it adds flexibility to the zoning so that instead of having to prove a hardship and going through the variation process, developer has a plan that overall benefits the community. Exactly may not comply with the zoning standards, but it benefits the community. For example, Bank of America side, maybe they're enhancing some public space that the whole community could use as part of their development, or the one-story buildings on the north side of Burlington, same thing. Maybe they want to do a village center type building, and in order to do a PUD, they have to provide some kind of public benefit like enhancement of open space or additional parking that otherwise would not be required. So it's a trade-off. It's not just an easy way to get around hardship and variation. Mr. Hannon? And I, it's an open question. Um, to address Trustee Pollock's concern that it becomes one of abuse, um, Attorney Molina, it, 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 you mentioned that it's set on a certain square footage limitation well, so, it, it can be, or it okay. can, it can that, that's the jurisdictional trigger. I think Trustee Pollock is concerned about something else, and that is that philosophically, what you, the reason you relax 
the strict bulk <coughs> requirements or strict zoning requirements in a given district to justify the plan development, to say you can do something different, is either creatively, aesthetically, it provides a benefit to the community that the board believes is a benefit to the whole community that they wouldn't have to do, you know, under the strict regulations and that warrant letting them do something different. Let's say add an extra story in this one case, taking Trustee Pollock's example of open space. This development, we have enough space in order to create a significant amount of open space that maybe ties into some some trail or something, a walking trail, but we'd like, in order to compensate for that loss of square footage, which we otherwise could build within the setback requirements, we'd like to go up an extra story than your code allows. That's an, ex uh, an example. And if I can continue, and then the process is the, the developer comes to us first without the need to show hardship, here's his plan, and then we would, as, as a board, you know, well, make comments and address it and, and then pat, uh, approve a, it or not. So in a, in, a, in a legalistic sense, someone could come in and submit an application for a plan development, which then would be set for public hearing and get input and then ultimately come before the board. Realistically, developers, you know, what is the village open to regarding creativity? Typically, they want to meet with staff first and, and some villages even have a pre kind of discussion to see whether the board might be open to something like this before they go to the expense to do a formal application. No guarantees, but because it's more flexible, there's more risk on the developer's side. They want to have some idea of what the village would like to see before spending a lot of money so, on plans. So, Director App, is that is the investigation that you're going to undertake is it going to be a survey of best practices or more in-depth survey or, or could you sort of explain what specifically i think is the going to be deliverable i think the idea would be to look at other communities and look at other um, what sort of developments that they are getting um, what are the areas where they should be allowed is this something we only want to be looking at in the commercial districts um, something do we want to look at in multifamily districts um, you know, what are, what are going to be the triggers, as, as Attorney Molina talked about, and start kind of talking through and establishing those. Um, if, the, if the trustees want to go forward with the PUD process, if you would rather just look at trying to see what adjustments we need to make to our bulk requirements, we can also take a look at that as well. If that's something, if we don't think the PUDs are necessarily worth that, do we need to be looking at our bulk regulations and see what we can change within those? Uh, to make it so that a variance wouldn't be needed. So my, my thoughts on it would be, I think that's a unique location on Harlem and Bronton, but I think that that's probably one of the only areas of real opportunity. I don't think the residents would want, you know, these the larger buildings that are downtown right now to kind of ruin the quaintness. So I, I, I would say the PUDs would, would probably be a distraction and just look at some of the, some of the other commercial districts with regard to variances there, mm -hmm. variance restrictions there. That'd just be my, my opinion. Other thoughts? I have two. One, um, I would like to see maybe examples of how other communities have done this because I think we all have in mind what, what you're thinking about right now, but it could be that there is something that <clears throat> has been done under a PUD that would be still quaint, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? So yeah. I'd like mm -hmm. to see examples. And then two, I don't know, maybe it doesn't have any impact, but from a historic or our, our, de our designation standpoint, like mm -hmm. is there any impact on that? Um, maybe it doesn't have anything, but. So the one thing, I, just to keep in mind, uh, when you <coughs> create triggers for a plan development, you are not rezoning the properties that are eligible for those triggers. They remain zoned what they are. And, and unlike the, the zoning that's in place, when the zoning is in place, a property owner who meets those requirements has a right to move forward if they don't need a variation. No one has a right to a plan development approval. They remain completely discretionary with the village board. Mm -hmm. right. So that's the, I mean, I believe that would address that. Mr. I'm sorry, just, were you, were you finished? No, I'm Thank you. Following up on what Attorney Molina just said, um, you know, when we talk about it, 
that eliminates the need for variation and showing of hardship, I think Attorney Molina would agree with me when I say that it still leaves full discretion with the village board to approve or deny. It does not take away any of our authority. It's not like we're suddenly opening the door to lesser right. development because we've eliminated the hardship criteria. No, as a matter of fact, I'd say you have more discretion to deny a PUD than a variation. And also, I, I would say, yeah, we use the example of taller buildings, but it's not necessarily what a PUD would be. It could yeah. be something completely different uh, than, than just a taller or larger buildings. Um, then finally, um, I mentioned that it can be abused, but that happens in towns that don't have a professional planning staff, professional management, and a responsible board. I could, I, there's, I cannot imagine that it would be abused in, in Riverside. So the only thing I would add to that, I, I, I certainly think it's worth pursuing in terms of continuing the discussion. I, I know in my time as a trustee and as president, I have seen both the Planning and Zoning Commission and, and the Village Board struggle in the instances where someone has requested a variation, where the variation simply did not meet the, the requirements of an undue hardship. And yet there was a desire on the behalf of the, <coughs> of the board to somehow allow it to happen, um, which is a serious problem in terms of setting precedent and giving giving guidance to our residents and to, and to potential developers. One of the things I like about the flexibility this would provide is it would not put the board in that kind of straitjacket, where it would have to be applying some kind of uh, highly objective test, which really the undue hardship is is intended to be. So um, do we have consensus that we would like to at least continue the discussion with yes. the staff and um, yeah, I just, yeah, yes, I just please. wanted to add um, that I agree with President Sells that the flexibility is important. I also think that it would be important for us to um, sort of find out what uh, developers are looking for so that our, our, the guidelines that we set are attractive. Um, you know, try not to make it too difficult. There has to be a balance. We want flexibility for them as well as on our decision-making side. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you very want me to work, come back with you with some examples first before I go to the Planning and Zoning Commission, or should I go to the Planning and Zoning Commission with those examples and then bring it back to you guys? I would say let's let them let, let them yeah. kind of vet it, and then they can bring back a, a fuller a fuller discussion to okay. the board. Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Director. Uh, any new business this evening? We do have need for an executive session to discuss the purchase or lease of real property for use of the public body, to discuss the setting of a price for sale or lease of village property, and to discuss the appointment, employment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees. I would ask for a motion a second to adjourn to executive session, not to reconvene, no final action will be taken. So moved by Mr. Gallagher. Second. By Ms. Evans, please call the vote. Trustee Peters. Aye. Trustee Gallagher. Aye. Trustee Jesa. Aye. Trustee Young. Aye. Trustee Evans. Aye. Trustee Powell. Aye. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you and good evening.